what's the alternative? If they're not going to respect the police and military, then I guess they're going to go for the Bloods and the Crips. Such was the story of my childhood intellectual environment. There was a great deal of love, care, and service to others, but in terms of the meta narrative, I was left wanting a little more. So, my, uh, my, this, these were the words of my father uh, in response to the likes of Colin Kaepernick uh, kneeling um, uh, in protest. And there was a conception that I grew up with that um, I had to wrestle with. Um, that, that can be embodied by that story, uh, where there's been growth and development since. I grew up uh, in an environment that was like I imagine uh, uh, many of you may have. Um, with my experience of Unitarian Universalism, uh, a number of folks at my home community uh, at UUFM in Murfreesboro uh, did. I uh, grew up in a, in a Christian uh, fundamentalist background. In my own case, uh, with more particularity, um, I grew up to think that I was going to be a minister. I thought that I was uh, supposed to be uh, something like, not quite the next Billy Graham or anything quite that extreme, uh, but I thought that it, I, I took the Great Commission very seriously. I thought that I was going to be traveling the globe, uh, preaching the gospel, and making sure that um, folks came to know uh, who Jesus was. And not only that, but in a very particular way, uh, right? Um, so guys, my name is Matthew Knight. I am a father. Um, you see my daughter here, Aurora, um, and my partner, Emily, uh, here seated up at the, up at the front. Uh, I'm a family man. Um, I'm a member of UUFM. I'm an alumnus of MTSU. And, uh, and the three of us reside in Murfreesboro. I'm ultimately concerned with well-being, human flourishing, and civic engagement. Um, and I have something of, a, a, I guess, a, a, an ethos. Um, but don't worry, these aren't bullet points that you're going to see addressed in kind of a commencement speech sort of way. Uh, but I just want to share that with you. And, and that is, um, it's create meaning, share stories, grow in wisdom, seek truth, live well, love everyone, and stay human. And that last part seems especially uh, important and especially prescient, not just for that talk, but uh, also just in these times. Um, stay human, um, meaning uh, stay humble. Stay human, meaning stay authentic. Stay human, meaning uh, keep an understanding of uh, what it is to be human, what is human nature, uh, and to stay in touch with that and all that that actually means. Um, things like, things as simple as uh, that we have a body and that we should be paying attention to and have an awareness of our body. It seems too often that we, for example, uh, can forget that because we get too caught into pretty devices like this one or the one in my pocket uh, and we forget to be human. Um, knowing Doug as I do and, and speaking with Doug as I have, he shared with me that you guys uh, do a lot of work around uh, meditation and things like that here uh, in Tullahoma, and I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I think that there's some really important things going on and practices like those um, to kind of combat uh, this uh, effervescent uh, addiction that we have to technology. But I grew up with, I want to get back to that story. Um, that, that is what I've known to be what I've come to call my 13 years ago story, uh, which is that up until I was about 12 or 13 years old, I was thinking that I was going to be that uh, evangelist, that I was going to carry out the Great Commission. Um, and then there's a what has transpired since story. Um, so this, this ultimately meant that I was wrestling with these themes of what fatherhood is, the message I received from my father, and then what fatherhood is now is rediscovering what that means and how I'm going to father Aurora. Um, it's meant wrestling with an understanding of citizenship, 
and connections of politics and religion. Um, but it's also part of that broader, what I've come to now know uh, as a Unitarian Universalist uh, search for truth uh, and meaning and all that that means, uh, the wrestling and the struggling. And I'll unpack the particular flavor of that in a moment. Um, too often along the search, it seems that we can feel like the distraught and damned Macbeth, who on learning of his wife's death, exclaims at a pitch of agony that man is a cursed creature who, quote, struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Life is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. There was a period where uh, as a result of, uh, and, and, I, and I, I use that quote with, with purpose, there was a period as a result of kind of loosening the bonds of a faith that had a very tight grip on me uh, and trying to decipher reality in other terms where I absolutely, uh, totally and fully felt that Macbeth, Macbeth quote. It seems more prescient than anything else could be. Um, it was so difficult to make sense uh, of, of the world once my, uh, once my total paradigm, once my entire lens had been kind of shattered. Um, so I had to start piecing something back together. And um, Doug asked me for a title, and I told him that I would, just, uh, I would just have to go with something as simple as Notes from a Fellow Traveler. Because I said that I don't want to, in my first talk, I don't want to... Um, pretend or come with pretense that I have any kind of grand insight to really share, but that I do think that oftentimes in the particular narratives that we can share, um, I think that we can uncover and sort of mine out some more universal uh, truths, some uh, more universal themes. So for me it, was, it became a journey that was about um, yes, it became a journey about wrestling with um, wrestling with suffering, making this seemingly wretched existence worthwhile. Um, it was taking part. Um, it was trying to invite myself and invite others into the process of truth seeking, of meaning making, of storytelling. <laughs> and it was coming to terms with a different understanding of philosophy on the whole. And one of the tools that, has, uh, that I found to be uh, most useful, I suppose, is um, uh, Bothius in his Consolation of Philosophy. Um, there's a story about a falling into despair, uh, a rapid fall from grace. Um, and he said he tries to choose to think his way out of his sorrows. And a woman's form, full of majesty, called Lady Philosophy, appears unto him, almost like uh, an angel, um, just like in the Bible. And so there is a particular form of Stoicism that Bothius um, begins to unfold. Which is a form, and this particular form is that uh, this is when philosophy was considered uh, not just something that was left to uh, folks with tweed jackets and elbow patches and smoking pipes, but from when philosophy was considered to be a set of tools. It was considered to be a toolkit on how to live and to die well. And among those lessons um, were that Human beings, human beings are not in control, that we're subject to fortuna, and that to be a philosopher means to understand all that fortune controls, so that we don't have control, but something akin to fate has control. Um, that 
there are that to that to be a philosopher means to understand all of that and those pieces, those um, contingent parts are things like love, family, children, reputation, career. They can all be lost at any moment. And with his uh, exploration of the Lady Fortuna uh, came the, the idea of the Wheel of Fortune. And it wasn't the game show. It was, um, it was uh, uh, to, to quote him, he said, if you're trying to stop her wheel from turning, you of all men are the most obtuse. You are seeking to retain what never belonged to you. So it's, in this there's a notion of submitting yourself to reality. Um, so Bothius learns that he must stop trusting in anything fortune can take away at once. Lady Philosophy t instructs him that you must possess yourself, and I think that she instructs us in that way. We must possess ourselves, and only ourselves, not that which is outside of us. We have to develop our inner citadel, our inner citadel of the mind. We must rise above our immediate circumstances, become indifferent to their fate, and identify with the forces of history and of nature. Now for me, on my journey, that's kind of a lot of uh, jargon. It's a story, there's some philosophy in there, there's a little bit of stoicism. For me, the way that was particularly expressed was that I was chasing romantic love, and I was chasing career and academic success, and, and that kind of became my focus. Uh, for quite some time after that transition from evangelist to feeling like I had the rug pulled out from underneath me, right? Um, so that became something of a focus. And I kept having, I kept noticing um, failure after failure after failure and an inability, uh, to be frank, to deal with that, to cope with that, to understand that, to come to terms with that. Um, and I think um, eventually, Stoicism, though not the only tool, uh, became a tool uh, that was that would, came to be very helpful. Um, I also played with and toyed with um, different notions of uh, Christianity and what that might look like. Um, me losing my faith was in part a, a result of. Um, conversations with my fellow Christians who interpreted Christianity differently than I. And I couldn't wrap my head around that because I thought they were just wrong. I had a very kind of black and white view of what that should look like. Uh, but fortunately there were some very strong influences in my life who had a, uh, who had a different um, view of what we could, how we could view Christ. And I actually, before I left my church, I had entertained that idea. Um, with what was supposed to be my very first sermon ever. And um, this sermon was uh, going to be given to, again, you have to understand, it's a, this is actually in rural East Tennessee is where I grew up. And it's a fundamentalist um, community. Um, and I have a notion that I'm going to give a sermon that is going to speak to what I think to be the real lesson and meaning of Jesus. So at this point, I'm thinking that the sermon is going to, um, you know, really speak about an emphasis on love. Um, I might even say some things that uh, remind the congregation, remind the congregants that he didn't explicitly say anything about all these divisive hot button issues that are so important to so many of you. He didn't take a position on that. What can we learn from his actual example and in that he spent so much time with the likes of uh, 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 a tax collector uh, who was hated, uh, Levi, then taking the name Matthew, that story becoming very important for someone named Matthew. Um, and, uh, you know, that he spent so much time with the downtrodden, that he spent so much time with uh, people who were um, something akin to the untouchables. Uh, of society if the people in his time had an untouchables class. Um, the parable of uh, the parables that he shared, uh, their meaning, um, 
I wanted to share those things. I wanted to share that sort of uh, understanding of, of, what I, of what I thought the true me meaning of Jesus was. But that ended up getting rejected, and I ended up having to leave, and I never got to give that sermon. So the very first sermon that I then was able to sermon, that I was ever able to give was um, a version of this one, um, which is when I decided to just share that story. Um, so what I wanted to share with you guys today, and I'm going to uh, continue to unpack a little further, is a little bit of that story, some things I picked up on the way, and then where I am now, where I find myself now, and the things that I'm thinking about Unitarian Universalism and what we're struggling with. Um, what does Unitarian Universalism mean now in this moment? What can it mean and what can we do with it? Uh, what, what value do we, do we really find in it? What do we aspire uh, to have in it? And so I'm really excited to engage in what will be my first talk back on this side uh, of things. <laughs> Uh, because I'm really excited to hear what you guys have to say about that. This is our collective and shared project. Not every one of you has the same story arc that I do. I know that everyone comes into Unitarian Universalism from a different per perspective and with a different experience. Um, and I hope to talk about what that means for us uh, a little bit later in this talk and then also in the talk back. Um, but I wanted to start with a little bit of uh, a few slices from what my story is. And now I have some, um, uh, some other tools, I guess, in the toolkit. A little bit of an analysis of how I kind of see our time, because um, I want to summarize a few key thinkers um, that I think have sort of analyzed our social political moment. Um, and somewhere around that time, I think I'll just turn it over to you guys and let you tell me how humble I should make myself. Um, which, is, which is to say, I really truly, um, there's no other way to do this other than to say explicitly, I don't want to pretend at all that I have, uh, um, that, I, that I have anything more to share or feel that I have anything more valuable to share than this community has to share. Uh, and so I'm hoping to just invite you guys into a larger conversation. So some things that I've found to be very useful and helpful for me. Um, another one is the concept, is a, there's a Greek concept called uh, tetrapharmakos, which is, uh, which is in English terms roughly translated as the four part cure, tetrapharma. The four part cure. And it is, um, I'll give you two ways to look at it. Uh, there's a translation by Robert Drew Hicks from uh, 1925. I'll give that to you and then I'll kind of walk you through those four. So, uh, number one is a happy and eternal being has no trouble himself and being, brings no trouble upon any other being. Hence, he is exempt from movements of anger and partiality, for every such movement implies weakness. Two, death is nothing to us, for the body, when it has been resolved into its elements, has no feeling, and that which has no feeling is nothing to us. Three, the magnitude of pleasure reaches its limit in the removal of all pain. When pleasure is present, so long as it is uninterrupted, there is no pain either of body or of mind or of both together. Four, continuous pain does not last long in the body. On the contrary, pain if extreme is present a short time, and even that degree of pain which barely outweighs pleasure in the body does not last for many days together. Illness of long duration even permit of an excess of pleasure over pain in the body. So, let's get a little more uh, compact, a little, a little easier to hear. Don't fear God. In Hellenistic religion, the gods were conceived of as hypothetical beings in a perpetual state of bliss, indestructible entities that are completely invulnerable. Gods in this view are male role models for human beings 
who are to emulate the happiness of the gods within limits imposed by human nature. And two, the summarized version, don't worry about death, at least not too much. In Epicurus' own words, death means nothing to us when we exist. Death is not yet present, and when death is present, we do not exist, for there is no afterlife. Death, says Epicurus, is the greatest anxiety of all in length and in intensity. This anxiety about death impedes the quality and happiness of one's life by the theory of afterlife. The worrying about whether or not one's deeds and actions in life will translate well into the region of the gods, the wondering whether one will be assigned to an eternity of pain or to an eternity of pleasure. The modern conception of this, the TED Talk version, is uh, given, I think, by David Brooks, who, uh, whose title can pretty much summarize almost the whole of the talk, which is, that you should worry about, spend more time worrying about your eulogy values rather than your resume values. Spend more time worrying about the values you live by rather than that emphasis that I fell prey to on career, right, on material success. What is good is easy to get, and I do apologize. Uh, my touch keyboard keeps popping up. Uh, what is good is easy to get, which is that the basic needs that we have, sustenance, shelter, these things can be acquired by anyone, both animal and human, with minimal effort, regardless of wealth. Well, I've got some major problems with that view. Uh, but there's a basic kind of-ish truth there, maybe. But if one wants more than one needs, overindulgency, gluttony, etc., one is limiting the chances of satisfaction and happiness and therefore creating a needless anxiety in one's life. What's good is easy to get implies that the minimum amount of necessity it takes to satisfy an urge is the maximum amount of interest a person should have in satisfying that urge. And then lastly, what is terrible is easy to endure. Uh, the Epicureans understood that in nature, illness and pain is not suffered for very long for pain and suffering is either brief or chronic, either mild or intense. But discomfort is both chronic and intense. That is both chronic and intense, is very unusual. So there's no need to be concerned about the prospect of suffering. Like what is good is easy to get, recognizing one's physical and mental limit <coughs> and one's threshold of pain, understanding how much the body or mind can endure, and maintaining confidence that pleasure only follows pain and then the avoidance of anxiety and about the length of that pain is the remedy against prolonged suffering. In other words, again, it's about what we can control versus what we can't. What we can endure versus what we can't. I came to learn that um, an ideal is a judge, that you'll never attain it. So because of that, you will always be insufficient to that ideal uh, through the Platonic theory of forms. So I started really kind of working myself through this um, kind of intellectual history of kind of the Greeks, right, if, you, if you've noticed. I started piecing that together. I started trying to reclaim some of these old ideas, dust them off the shelf, and put them back together. And somewhere around the time I was doing this, I noticed that alongside some of the problems that I had with uh, that faith that I was sort of brought up into, along with that, I had completely discarded some things that I so desperately needed. Which is to say, I found that I had, along with a number of metaphysical things that I couldn't, could no longer uh, hold fast to, I had also discarded things like grace, and I found that I had also discarded uh, what was my understanding of forgiveness. And so I had to take myself through a process of reclaiming that. And then along that process, I kept struggling with, and I kept confronting the question and problem. Uh, existence, the questions and problems of uh, whether 
whether, whether it might all be meaningless. What is a value? Um, and that's why I was really struggling with this ideal as a judge because growing up with uh, exacting standards, um, uh, the father who was a Marine Corps marksmanship instructor, um, it was very difficult for me to divorce myself from that notion of holding myself to exacting standards, to uh, always um, ascribe my personal worth as a person to whether I was holding up those exacting standards and the like. So then I started asking, what would, what would it look like if we, um, <coughs> in a state that seemed to be chaos, what would it look like if we were able to all get our acts together collectively? What, what, does that, what does that actually look like in a, in a pluralistic society in the United States? Or if we're to try to make peace in a global community? There are a number of differences that we, that we hold. There are a number of com competing <coughs> truth claims that we hold. And if they can't all be true at the same time, um, how do we resolve that? And around that time, uh, I, uh, I stumbled upon, um, uh, there were a number of political philosophers that I was, I was reading in my, um, in my course of academic study. And there was a guy by the name of John Rawls who is most, most helpful, most useful um, for that question point was he spoke of an over, what he called an overlapping consensus that when in the United States when we had a number of diverse factions uh, spoken about and almost prophesied by James Madison and Federalist 10 um, the notion that we might have something like a pluralism if we were going to conduct ourselves and have a common law for a diverse people was going to require an understanding that these competing interests, competing rival conceptions of the good that make conflictory truth claims. But the way we were going to have to deal with that was to approach an overlapping consensus, i.e., if you can imagine something like a Venn diagram, uh, it's a collective Venn diagram of all in the United States. What do, we, what do we all have in common even when we have conflicting interests? How do we establish a, a law and a land? When you really think about this, where we have people who uh, believe that vaccination is an absolute moral responsibility to protect and inoculate not just children, but also those in society. And then we have folks who don't believe that. We have folks who don't believe things like that sometimes for religious reasons. And we have a uh, moral principle enshrined in our Constitution around respect for religious difference. So this often means that doctors even are constrained. Um, they have uh, very, uh, <coughs> very difficult moral questions that they sometimes have to deal with, say, around blood transfusions, uh, if they're dealing with a family of Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. There are a number of very difficult moral questions that arise as a result of there not being a whole lot of homogeneity. Um, not everyone thinks the same way. Not everyone has the same suppositions, i.e. Um, we have folks who in the United States who believe in Scientology, we have uh, folks in the United States who are Muslim, who are Christian, and who are on believe in a variety of sects uh, of each of those religions. And we could keep doing this. There are, um, but when we really understand the implications of that, we're talking about people actually believe that very basic, their very basic groundedness that they even ground a notion of truth in. The very basic <coughs> way that they ground any conception of what is the right, the very basic conception of what is the good, uh, what is the good society, 
what does it mean to be friendly or cooperative with my neighbor? Should I even be friendly or cooperative with my neighbor at all? Do I have a moral obligation? Well, what if they look different than me? What if they talk differently than me, etc.? cetera? Um, the in-group, out-group dynamic. Um, Rawls, Rawls suggested that the way that we would do this is find where the most, where the overlap is among such a diverse society. And I find myself still, though I value that, and I think that oftentimes um, our courts can get, it, can get it right when they adequately understand various competing interests uh, going on at the same time. While I, while I have an appreciation for that, I worry and wonder and have questions about what that really means for how we come to access and understand truth. Um, and sometimes that puts me in a position where I, um, I start to wonder what can we then ground uh, truth in? What can we ground the good life in? What can we ground our ethics in? that we can share within Unitarian Universalism, that we can share within our communities, and that we can share uh, across the United States and throughout the globe, uh, that will actually speak to everyone, but that doesn't become so generalized and abstract that it loses its power and meaning. So I think that I've got um, a few things that I might uh, share with you over the course of our talk back on um, uh, a number of thinkers, uh, about three thinkers that I want to share with you on their analysis of our that current political environment, uh, which is what are the ingredients necessary for a populist backlash? Um, and then I want to take this really hard and difficult question about uh, chaos and about coming to understand this conception of truth and so on, and see what we as Unitarian Universalists might have to say in response to our current situation. Thank you so much for having me.